And we rolled in on 3 October, um, flared, threw the ropes out, fast roped into a dust bowl. I don't even know. We were outside the perimeter of the Rangers who had already been set in. So there's a danger of running in and getting shot by your own kind. Um, we're already taking fire. Uh, Blackburn already fell out of another helicopter. We landed, had to take take another house down full of a family that was just horrible. And then, you know, left them, fought our way down the street, got to the Target building, took all the detainees, searched the building, rolled up, ready to go, and a five-ton get hits with an RPG um, and caught fire. I, d I didn't get the reports of who's injured and wounded and stuff, but I know it's kind of happening. And then we're waiting to exfil in the courtyard, and I hear an RPG go off overhead. I, I happened to look up and caught the tail of the... The, the Blackhawk spinning off to the east and north a little bit. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I served war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear the combat story of Tom Satterley, Command Sergeant Major retired who spent 20 years in the Army's elite Delta Force. His 25-year Army career took him from the storied Battle of Mogadishu, as depicted in Black Hawk Down, to the capture of Saddam Hussein, and much more. The brutal fighting in op tempo took a toll on Tom as he lived and survived with post-traumatic stress for years. Tom and his wife Jen have since created the All Secure Foundation, which helps special operators and their families in the recovery of PTS. His book, All Secure, chronicles his success and struggles from the battlefield and back to the home front while providing an inside look at Delta. I hope you enjoy his stories as much as I did. All right, Tom, thank you for uh, taking the time to share your story today. Absolutely, my pleasure. You know, anytime, anytime we can get our story out to people is, is a win for us because if we reach one person, you know, then we're, we're, we're helping somebody. So I appreciate you having me on here and, and interviewing me about this stuff. Absolutely. And I will say, I just, uh, I finished up All Secure, your book. I uh, just wrapped it up this past weekend. Uh, big thank you for putting yourself out there and really laying out not just the, the combat experiences, but what happened before and after. Uh, I'm sure it wasn't easy to do, but I'm really grateful. A lot of it resonated with me and I'm sure it does with many other people. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. And we, we do get a lot of messages about, I thought your book was one thing. And I went back and read it again, and it was absolutely another book. I'm like, yeah, it's not a book about bragging and killing people all the time. I like it's that's in there to keep people interested because nobody's going to pick a book on how somebody screwed up their entire life over and over again. So you got to keep it in for a little bit. Yeah. Well, I will say, I mean, it, the book takes you through your time in Delta, the the most elite unit that we've got. Any person who served in the in the military and the combat arms certainly knows the. The, the status of that organization and you didn't just jump in and out. I mean, you were in it for a career from Battle of Mogadishu through to, to Saddam in the post 9-11 era. So you'd seen it all. And I think my, my initial question here has to do with, I think for those who hadn't met an operator like yourself, you have this vision of this ultimate warrior. You grew up in Montana, out in the woods somewhere, maybe you're out hunting at a young age. But the book tells a different story. So I'd be curious if you could kind of talk us through what was your pre-military life like and and what did that look like to set you up for what you later became? Yeah, my pre-military life was just growing up in Indiana, running around causing trouble. I, mean, I was the youngest of three. So by the time they got to me, my parents had already figured it out. You know, you don't have to be there for everything. You could leave them alone and they'll live. So I think I was left to my own devices. And so I became more crafty and... Uh, we, we, we would run, me and my friends would run around in the summers and never go home. We'd run around all night around the lakes that we lived on and camp out in the, in the empty lot next door. But, you know, I didn't even consider that any military type training. And my, my father was not in the military. I think he missed out due to children and, and age at the time. Not missed out, but uh, he didn't have to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And my brother had joined when he was a junior, in between junior and senior year in high school, he went to basic training. And so his senior year in high school, I was a freshman in the same high wow. school. And I'm embarrassed. Um, I was making fun of my brother for his haircut, for joining the military. You're an idiot, you know? And I had no idea what I was going to do. I mean, what was I going to do? I had no clue. I still don't have a clue what I'm going to do anymore. But 
it's uh yeah i had no really preparation for it um no family member pushing me that way um and then one day one of my best friends you know he joined the military and i was working building houses in indiana and he came home from basic training and uh, he was telling me how great it was on a, on a drive up to a john cougar concert oh it's great i'm going to germany for two years this haircut's not even that bad we we got up and we did exercise and we did obstacle courses and it was great and we got to shoot guns and i thought man I'm going to do that. I mean, that was my thought process. That hour long drive or hour and a half drive to Indianapolis from Columbus was, was I think I'll join the military. And I did. And I went home and told my parents about it. And they're like, you did what? What'd you do? What about this? What about that? I'm like, what about, I didn't, I didn't have plans. I mean, maybe my parents did. Um, I started college. I, I blew all their money having a good time. And so I thought, well, I'll get college money. I'll join the military. I'll get in, I'll get out. I'll go back to college. Have fun. You know, I'll, I'll be back in four years. I'll see you guys later. And then I blinked, you know, somewhere along the way I blinked. And wow. I ended up 25 years later, I'm retiring going, I can't get away quick enough. You know, so. Yeah. How yeah, about I don't know your what, brother? Your brother was in? I, I didn't realize that. What, what did he end up doing and uh, how long did he stay? He was infantry. He went in and um, they actually, he was going to go to West Point. And they were going to ask him to teach at West Point. He was pretty intelligent. And he ended up, he wanted to get married. He was in love and they won't take you married at West Point. So he, he turned down West Point to get married and then became a drill sergeant. And then he got, he got a Crohn's disease and they, you know, they can't, you can't have that in the military too much. Not a lot of MREs will do that. will kill you if you got Crohn's disease. So he ended up getting out. And I'll tell you what, he still talks about it to this day. And I've noticed that the people that get in and then get out at a certain time, not, not the four-year people with a plan, but like the nine-year, the 11-year, here, here they are, nine to 10 years later, you know, nine to 12 years later going, man, I should have stayed in. I'd be retired right now. And I had all these benefits. I'm like, well, they're not that many benefits, but they are better than none. And it's a mm -hmm. house pain. You know, it's medical yeah. stuff. A lot to not worry about in a month. So... I hear that a lot, but my brother, and conversely, I hear a lot from people who do get out that I should have stayed in. I missed it, whether they got out on their own or they, they got out on a medical, but you know, I'm not that way. I don't want to talk about it when I'm, when I'm at the table or now that I'm out, it's, it's not what I wanted, wanted to do because I was done with, it. I've done it so much. I yeah. didn't, I, I wanted, I wanted it to go away. I wanted it to be different from that lifestyle, but yeah, he, uh, he got out on a, on a medical and he's probably hated it ever since. Yeah, definitely understand that. And then if we stay there, I mean, it looked like you had a really close relationship with your with your dad, with your old man, right? It looked like he was kind of showing you stuff out in the woods sometimes. And again, like my mind goes to you in selection and the work that you did later on. Like, were you exposed to navigation, weapons, anything like that at an earlier age? Or were you just competitive and athletic? I was competitive and athletic. I never held a weapon as a child. I never held a weapon until basic training. Um, I mean, a BB gun, shoot the neighbor's window. Yeah. I'm trying to <laughs> shoot out of the sky, and hit the window and, uh, you know, never pick up a BB gun again. But, you know, my dad gave me a comfort in the woods, um, floating down the river and killing time. You know, we'd float down a flat bottom boat and check trout lines and, 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 and look for turtles and whatnot. And it would take forever. And I, I was always so amped up. I mean, I still am pretty much. I'm, I'm kind of that type A, I got to go, I got to go, I got to go. And when I'm not doing something, I feel horrible about myself. And so he taught me to calm down and slow down and go with the river and go with the woods and nature. So during selection, you know, most of my military career, that didn't really pay off until SFAS uh, selection out there when you're out there alone doing navigation and and I didn't really know how to do land nav until they taught me and that was just compass and azimuth very you know when you're doing Fort Bragg and it's flat you're looking for old streams and dirt roads that aren't there anymore now you go to the mountains of West Virginia and it's train association once I got it well I got it that was easy oh there's a mountain there oh yeah that's what it looks like on the oh I can see on that map what I don't want to walk through you know and then the experience of walking up there for so long in the mountains told you, okay, that draw is going to be full of Mount Laurel or that stream's not wide enough to be, you know, trafficable. So I learned that quick, but I remained calm, even though I would get lost from time to time. 
I would remain calm because when you get lost, people take off running the wrong direction. And then they'd end up calling you four hours later with a quarter they have taped in their notebook. Like I'm lost and here, here I am, would go get them, you know? But I, I, I kept myself from being that person that got lost and panicked and made it worse. You know, if I got lost, I would stop, kind of do the map check and actually do those resections. You know, I do a mm-hmm. resection. I actually utilize that technique because yep. I was really lost and, uh, and it worked. And I, so I was, I just kind of remained calm and just kept plugging along and, and that never quit attitude. Um, and honestly, due to embarrassment, right? I never wanted to be so embarrassed that I quit something that I just wouldn't quit. Right. So, so this brings me to something that come, that seems to come up a lot in the book that I'm glad you raised this. It, it's almost like despite all of the success that you had being in these elite units, you you almost consistently seem to suffer from I think what people might call imposter syndrome or like I'm not good enough and I don't want somebody else to take my spot and I could be released at any moment and I, I think a lot of Type A people can relate to that and it's even harder to look at someone like yourself when you're in the unit at that level thinking like you've made it I mean why would you be worried I'm wondering if that was something that happened after you joined the military or did you recognize that in yourself? when you were younger? You know, it's funny when people ask me questions about my past and before the military, number one, I barely remember it. Um, number two, well, looking back with, for your question, I, I'm like, I don't know. Um, I think I didn't, ha- I didn't have a lot of experiences as a child. We didn't go on vacations. We didn't have money. My parents both worked, um, lived in a small house with three kids, finally built you know, save to build a bigger house, you know, to where we had two bedrooms between three kids. Um, but I didn't have a lot of experiences. I didn't travel the world. I didn't do anything. And um, so I think I was really taught everything, you know, that I that I know now. I, I, I look back now, I'm like, man, I don't know. Uh, I probably couldn't have. And I think it's clouded by my, my memories now. And, and, and it goes with like PTS and depression and how'd you feel then and versus now I'm like well I can look at it now and think of it totally different than I thought of it then you know then it's almost difficult for me to even consider my thought process I was so entrenched or messed up or hung over or drunk or or something that I you know I wasn't clear thinking anyway um and mm-hmm. I have a lot of memory issues to where now I've gone to countries I totally forgot I've been to. And <laughs> I've done things in countries. I'm like, and I'll see someone on TV. I go, oh, I'm there. I'm like, where is that? I'm like, oh my God, I've got, that's right. I was there with, you know, this one year. And I, I've forgotten deployments and, and, yeah. and tra- training missions. And it's, and it's weird to me that, that I can't recall those memories anymore. And I can't, those comparisons are difficult. Because I was yeah. a complete person then that I, it's hard for me to even remember now. Mm-hmm. When you joined up, you were saying that you kind of made this decision spur of the moment. Did you have a discussion with your dad or your mom or or your brother about it? Or was it literally like you were in that car, your buddies talking to you about going to Germany and, and that was it? No, that was it. I didn't tell them until, until after the fact because I figured there'd be some, uh, there'd be some issues with it. I was old enough. I didn't need their permission. Uh, you know, we weren't at war, so it probably wasn't as terrifying as it has been for the last 20 some years for parents who have joined. My, my own son joined for a bit. I'm right. Like, oh, God, you know, here we go. I'm that parent. Um, but I know parents have gone to combat missions with their sons, you know, flew down to Baghdad and did a combat jump or did a combat mission. I'm like, man, that, that would terrify me too much. That would be, my son would be behind me. I'd be like, what are you doing? You know, I'd be that father. What are you doing? Get over here. You're doing that wrong. <laughs> I'd get killed or he'd get killed because of me. So, yeah, that's it. No, I hear you. So, when you got in, did you have this idea that you wanted to go to these elite units, or or was it just kind of finding your way? How, how did that come to be? Because certainly you go, you end up in in the SF lane, and then you t- you go on to the unit. So, was it planned out? Did it just happen? You know, yeah, it was not planned out. And I don't know if this is the part of the book that didn't make it. I think we ended up with a hundred and some thousand words, but when I finished, it was 120,000 some words. And they were like, no, we already planned for a hundred. I'm like, well, bigger books better. And I didn't get the whole ink and paper cost money. So no, we're not going to do more. Um, 
So we had to cut out 120 or 20,000 words, which I think a lot of that was cut out. I think, I don't, I don't remember anymore. Um, but I went to Germany with just the fact that I'm going to Germany. I was terrified. I mean, I literally got married on my way to Germany because I don't know. I don't know what, you know, I, I think it's just, I gotta be married. I'll be alone, you know, for the first time in my life. I don't need to be alone in a foreign country. It was, and I got there and it was horrible. The regular army was kind of boring. Motor pool Mondays, I'm driving an APC. I got to change the oil. Their heater never works in the winter, but it's on full speed in the summer. I'm like, man, the regular army sucks. And I was just going to get out. Right. And in, in four years I'm out, I got college money. I'll be back in college. And then, um, we had a platoon sergeant. He was in the Hungarian army before. And the other platoon sergeants were like Vietnam vets. They were burnt out and tired. And I get that now. And back then I'm like, what's wrong with these old guys? You know, they're crazy, <laughs> but do anything. I get it. Now. Yeah, actually, Tom, what year was it? Can you just say like, yeah, that was 86. Yeah. Okay, great. Keep going. Yeah. I know yeah, what you mean. Six, 86, 87, you know, or 86, 89, really. But I remember my first Pantu sergeant was an old Vietnam guy. He'd jump out the window, you know, who runs this motherfucker? And whoa, shit. And it was like a one and a half story, two story window. He'd jump out and well, he was an old guy, but uh, he was kind of burnt out other than that. But the Hungarian platoon sergeant that took over, he, he was, he knew about different schools in Europe. So we went to platoon competence training in Bad Tolz, Germany, which was run by some Green Berets. And that was stuff I'd never done before. When you're in a mech combat engineer unit, you're not going to do stuff like slack Australian rappel, where you jump off the tower face down with about 30 feet of slack. And when it catches up, you slow down and hit the ground. Um, things like that, just more dangerous stuff. And then we went to French commando school, the first platoon to go through French commando school together. And that was awesome. And the fun that we did and the things that they showed you in the hand to hand and the obstacle courses and the danger, um, you know, as a young kid, as a young man or boy, you want to test yourself like they've done in tribes forever that, that becoming a man thing. So that's kind of a self induced. I'm going to do more scary stuff. I want to do more things that test me and see. And I just kept getting more and more of a taste. And then they had a slot come up. Um, well, then we went to uh, I forgot what the name of the march was. The Swiss March down in Bern, Switzerland. It's a 40 mile march through the through the Alps. You know, we went and did that. And um, I thought, well, I can do all this stuff. I can go long distances and it's fun. And then they had a slot for German Ranger School came up and there was like 800 to 1,000 people that wanted a slot. There was a an officer in the battalion command that said, I'll take the slot. And I, and I kind of went, well, why would you take it? I mean, why would it just be given to you? I think you should have a competition. So they had a battalion competition and I won that. I got to go to German Ranger School. And then, they, of course, they didn't speak any English there. And so they sent a, a, a translator with me who failed out the first week. <laughs> and so it was a miserable <laughs> experience for me to try to make it through those stressful moments where you use humor. You know, I use humor for everything when I get uncomfortable or too emotional or I'm tired. It's humor, right? I'll use humor. Sometimes it's raw, angry humor. Sometimes it's funny humor. But when you're telling a group of Germans a story and they're just, you know, and you hit the punchline, they just kind of look at you like, huh, huh, boss, boss is das. I'm like, oh. I started crying. I was like, I'm going to go out and polish my boots and pull security, man. I just, I just needed something. And, you know, made it, but I could be alone. I could be alone in a foreign country, not even speak to people and still get it. I started learning. And so I, I signed up to go uh, be a Green Beret because a, a close friend of mine carried a picture of his father holding him as a baby wearing a green beret in his arms his father's green beret and he was a green beret in vietnam he's like i'm gonna be a green beret tom i'm gonna be a green beret and um he never quite made it but i adopted his dream when i was over there he left germany a year before i did and uh and he didn't he didn't make those steps he went a different route and i i went ahead and decided to adopt his dream and i didn't find and i i made sf i had to re-enlist because i i was already an e5 I had one soldier of the year, so they gave me E5, and, but I didn't have PLDC, which is primary leadership development course, mm -hmm. which you need to go to SF, and you needed to make E5, but I made E5 so fast, so I said, well, let me get to the school then, so I can go sign up to be a Green Beret, and they're like, well, you don't need the school, so let's send the E4s, so they, they kept holding me back. Uh -huh. So I had to, I just re-enlisted for jump school, just to get to Fort Bragg. So I got to Fort Bragg, and I found the recruiters, finally got PLDC under my belt, um, actually as a Green Beret. They sent me as a Green Beret first. That was the first thing I did. So they went ahead and took me and sent me, but 
it was one of those processes that I adopted his dream and we found out just this year that his father lied to him the whole time. <laughs> he, was no never, way. he was never a Green Beret. And I was like, that's the first instance of stolen valor that that prompted a dream that was built that, you know, that I that I actually made. And uh, it was a, it was a false dream. Wow. So that, yeah, he just told me that just this year when we were talking because we're still friends. And I was like, man, that that stinks. You know, he's like, I don't talk to that piece of shit anymore. I'm like, wow. The things that, you know, people make up and I hear it more and more. It's weird. That, uh, wow. So but it sounds yeah. like you were in one of the coolest mech units ever if they let you go to all these different schools. It was really cool. We didn't do anything else. I mean, you know, we, you know, my squad wanted sapper stakes in Europe, the, the Germany, the German engineer thing where you got, they set up these huge tents and put minefields in them and stuff. You got to probe through and find all the mines and, you know, can your squad set up triple standard concertina? Can it blow a bridge? Can it build a bridge? And it was all timed to competition. So we went to that and would win that, but. It was, uh, he kept us going. I mean, he kept us moving and he knew how to keep us interested and it was hard. And then I started training for more and more and you know, I'd have guys that were in trouble for being overweight and they'd come up to me. I didn't know how to teach people, you know, back then I was a kid myself and I want to be like you. I need to lose weight. Can you help me be like you? Yeah. And I'd be down the ground, low crumb with my ruck on my back, you know, things that just suck. It doesn't matter. And, uh, I'd have these people doing stuff like this. I didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> but they wanted it. They, I saw that they wanted something more right? They now do they want to put in the work for that, right? Everybody right. wants some. And that's when yeah. I started. Of, oh, everybody wants more, but not everybody can make it. And then I realized, well, not everybody can make it because not everybody wants to put in the work to do the more, you know? Mm -hmm. There's some that don't want to do the work. There's some that don't want to do all the work. And then there's some that do all the work and just aren't cut out for it, you know? It's, it's, a, it's a pretty good filter that they have working your way up through special operations into different units, you know, throughout the world. When you put people through a filter, you end up getting the best and then everybody wants that, but they don't want to go through the work and then they want to change it. I want to change this. I want to fix it. You need to hire more. You need to bring in more. Like it, the system works. The system works to, to filter people through, to get those guys who will do the jobs that nobody really wants to do, but they want the, the glory of saying they did it. Mm -hmm. and, and I got to say, I mean, that, so that's an interesting segue because you find your way into the military, you then, it sounds like you kind of had to fight to get into SF. It's not like somebody came and was like, hey, just come on along and, and sign up here. But then talk to talk about how you made the jump into Delta, which um, especially at that time was even more secretive. I mean, it's secretive now, it was secret, even more secretive back then and probably harder to get into. There's more units now from the way you describe it in the book. So back then, how did you find your way into that? Again, another lucky stumble. Um, <laughs> I don't know an ability to ever take credit for anything or not see that I should take credit for anything because I don't think that I did anything. You know, there was two guys from the unit that were going through the Q course with me. Um, and there's other several reasons people do that. You can go to the unit from any unit as long as they have a headquarters at JSOC, right? You could be, we had guys from the Army band go through and sure. make it pretty, make, made it pretty far. You know, we call right. it. I called him guitar man. He brought a guitar to selection. He had jump boots, the the slick bottom jump boots, and made it to stress most, you know, most of the way. Wow. Um, but if you go, you compete as that that MOS, that specialty skill. So if you're in Delta, then you're say a crane operator. You're competing against other crane operators, and if you don't have what other crane operators have, you might get passed over, even though you're in Delta. Now you go to a secret board and that gives people that, ooh, secret board stuff, stamp him approved, you know, so that helps out. But these guys wanted to get promoted. They were Rangers, I think. So they wanted to go to the Q course because SF guys got promoted quicker. So they're going through the Q course from the unit, and, you know, mm -hmm. just the six month school. And I didn't know they were already in the unit. And I also didn't know that I should have went that route because if you go to unit selection, you don't have to go to SF selection. I went to SF <laughs> And unit selection. So you did it all. Kind of sucked. <laughs> but they're, 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 they were there trying to change their MOS to get promoted. And when it was all over, I was friends with one of them. I knew the other, but I didn't know what they did. When it was all over and I was in language school, they showed up one day. And I was outside on a break doing flutter kicks and whatnot, trying to stay in shape. And they said, hey, I want to talk to you. You know, hey, you need to call this number. It's a recruiter for the unit. You, you think you should do that? And I'm like, yeah, I, 
if it's better than what I'm doing now, I'll do anything, you know, anything that's a climb up. Because I'd seen a, a briefing in Germany. I snuck into a briefing. I wasn't old enough. I snuck into a briefing and the guy's like, you know, those old circular things with the little square photos in them. They pop up and come out and go up on the screen. That was that was a thing back then. That was high speed. He had a suit on. He was standing down in front of the movie theater and he clicks it. And it's a picture of the world. Just just a picture of the world. I think it might have been. It wasn't spinning. It was just a picture of the world. And uh, I don't think we had technology to spin it back. Then, right. But it was a picture of the world. He goes, this is our training area. And then he clicks it off. He goes, any questions? <laughs> Briefing over. And, and I went and I thought, well, that's great. I'd love to do that. I don't know why, but I'd love to do that. And then he talked a little about it. He answered questions. The guy's like, mm. well, will I build a girl long hair? And he goes, if you want long hair, I don't want your ass. Do you get paid more money? If you're doing it for money, I don't want your ass. I mean, so it was mostly an hour of him telling people, I don't want you. We don't wow. need you. You're doing it for this. We don't want you there. You know, and I'm like, whoa, I want to be there right now. You know, I want to be there right now. And then it skipped my mind. And then they uh, they approached me in language school and uh, like, hey, call this number. We've already told them about you. All right. I think you have what it takes. You know, if you want to wow. do that, like, yeah, I'll do that, man. Let's try that. And so I, I did. I put in a packet. They came, gave me a PT test, psych evals, and I, I finished language school, went to Fort Campbell for a very short period. And they were all deployed in the first Gulf War. So there's like two of us in second battalion, an injured medic and me. And I'm non-deployable because I have a selection date and that trumps combat. I didn't know that. So there's there's a missed combat thing that upset me back then. Um, and I, I, you know, I go to selection. I go to selection that spring. And then I made it. I come back and the entire fifth group shows back up, you know. Like, hey, a new guy, who are you? And I'm like, don't worry about it. I'm on my way out the door. And I, I left like a week later, went right back wow. and forth and started OTC. And what a what a journey that was. But you know, I've stumbled and stumbled and uh, stumbled or just lucked into or it was just right place, right time, or you know, I've never made that plan. I didn't have that dream of I'm gonna one day I'll be dealt. I swear it. No, it was just sure I'll do that, whatever, you know. And and funny enough, when I got to the unit and you sit down, you talk to the psychs, you know, hey, so you made it, it's great. So what now? I'm like, I don't know, what is there? And they go, Exactly. You're that guy that climbs a mountain, you don't even you don't even enjoy it. You look for the next one. You look for the next Interesting. one. Interesting. Said, when are you going to enjoy the mountaintop? I go, when there's no more, I guess. I don't know. You know, it's one of those intro, welcome to the unit evaluations, probably. Wow. And, uh, yeah, I just, uh, I didn't, I always tried to climb in the unit. Like, I, oh, we have a combat team competition coming up where counter-terrorist teams from all over the world compete, you know, and it's in Germany. Sure, I'll do that. Made the team, went over. Got injured uh, two days before we left, rolled my ankle jumping off of a moving car. And so I, I got to go and watch. I didn't compete, but I mean, we won all, every event but two to include beating the SEALs in their own in swimming events. So, I mean, we just, everything we did, we did 200%. And then the small percentage of the guys in that, <laughs> that, that unit would go 500% or, you know, more and more and more and just destroy your bodies just to, compete within that organization to be on top. And, but they know, saw that in you at a very early point. The, the Sykes saw that in, that kind of like characteristic in you that, all right, now you got here, you didn't enjoy the ride up, and now there's very yeah. few places left to go. I think that was their concern looking back, was like, are you going to leave? Are you going to be happy here? What's going to happen to you from a guy who keeps – going to one school oh nope next school oh nope next school you know i didn't even try out sf i, I was in it and I, the course the language school boom i'm in delta and so you know down the road like when i retired and they hired me uh over in amon jordan they broke out this special you know king king you know for prince hashim and, and king hussein have this this program they want to start up to train their soldiers to be special force qualified and they're based off the american thing we want you to do it i'm like no, no, I was in Delta. I wasn't in SF. I didn't do SF stuff. That's an SF mission. Yeah, but you're the guy. I'm like, I was in Delta, man. I only went to the Q course. They're like, listen, you're the dude. I'm like, all right, I'll do it. So I built a team of, I hired nine other SF guys. <laughs> yeah. You know, commo, medic, you know, all that. Well, I didn't hire, I hired medics for myself and to take care of the boys, but we didn't teach medical stuff. But 
So I ran that program for two years, but I, I fully tell people, you know, I'm a green beret, but I didn't, I didn't do that mission. You know, that's a different yeah. mission. Um, Interesting. So you, you touched on something that I wanted to jump on here in the book. You talk about being in training when Panama happens. And just now you referenced you're waiting at Campbell for selection when the Gulf War happens. And for somebody who's looking for the next mountain to climb, I, you describe in the book how difficult it was to watch Panama happen and not be there. And then you also have the Gulf War. What was going through your mind at that time? Man, again, you know, wanting to test your metal, wanting to try all those things you've been taught. Like my wife would ask me now, she was never involved in the military while I was in. Why do you want to go to combat? And I go, because I've never been, man, right? You, you've been so highly trained to do something. I imagine you being highly trained to drive race cars, but you never get a race, right? What good is that? You, you want to race. Even though the dangers are there, you want to do it. I said, I had to go to combat. I, I needed to go to combat. Um, and I, I thought we were invincible. Who could touch us? I mean, we're so highly trained. We have all the money in the world to do whatever we want. All our equipment's great. You know, I'm wearing a plastic helmet and the smallest Kevlar in the world I could make. I sewed it myself so it'd be smaller. And, you know, I'm fast and light and you never think I can't outrun a bullet no matter how fast I run. But, you know, yeah, just dying to go to combat. We, you know, travel before combat, traveling around the world in a unit doing things that are dangerous, but it's not combat. It's scary. It's not, I mean, nobody's shooting at you really. It's, uh, you know, I've had a gun put in my mouth, but it wasn't pulled. <laughs> Trigger wasn't pulled, so that was good. But, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't terrifying. It was. It was exhilarating. You know, it's almost like spy stuff, running around doing things in a country where you, you you've got the okay. You're you're legal, but you're not legal. So you mm -hmm. go either. Way. You know, yeah, you have that, you have that legal backing that makes you feel like it's good to go. So you have that confidence. But yeah, I was chomping at the bit to get into combat, um, so. which. Started in Somalia with you know a couple of bullets flying here and there. I thought, ooh, this is combat, man. I I don't get to shoot because I never see anything, but man, the bullets are flying nearby. Some things are getting blown up nearby, you know. And we get the bad guys and we're winning. That's what combat's all about, you know. And then and then you get into real combat. You never ever want to go back. You know? So hold that thought because I, I want to ask about the long walk that you describe in this book. Um, part of it's it sounds like it's the stress phase of selection for delta and the the reason i bring it up is as you just described like you were soldier of the year you went through all these courses sf you're in selection later on you're going to go on to do, to be a command sergeant major in delta um but there's a point where you're on this so I, i'd love to hear what is the long walk and then there's this point where you're like i'm done like you guys have broken me and to from the outside looking at you it's like how on earth could this guy be broken so i'd love to hear what that sound what it felt like doing a long walk mm, yeah the long walk is the comp the final phase of selection uh, well the final phase of the stress portion of selection there's many phases um it's probably still ongoing they always said selection's ongoing i'm probably still being selected but <laughs> you know you you've been walking for nearly uh, three weeks, you know, start off instructional phase or admin phase, you PT test, swim test back in the day, some paperwork. And then you go into instructional phase where they teach you everything you need to know. So go into selection, you, you could go up there not knowing anything. So there, I, that removes everybody's excuses. They give everybody the same things. That removes everybody's excuses for why someone else made it. And everybody is under the same standards. And they've never changed selection minus a few things and they had reasons for removing them was because not everybody saw it or it didn't evaluate something specific that we needed, you know? So there's always a reason that they removed or changed things, but it's, it's generally stayed the same. And then you go through instructional phase where you're walking with your rucksack all the time. I mean, up and down these mountains and the instructors are showing you, here's a mountain, that's what it looks like on the map. Here's a valley, here's a draw, blah, blah, blah. Here's a you resection. So what, if you know it, you're getting it, it's reinforced. If you don't know it, you're learning it. And then they send you out on your own to practice. And then they, let you practice checking in and out of RV. So everything is, is rehearsed. They let you practice. 
and then stress fish starts. You know, it's like you know it's coming when you you go to dinner one night and there's steak and lobster. You know, oh shit, what's tomorrow? You know, <laughs> you day and there's uh, they hand you a weapon with no sling on it, and you haven't had a weapon the whole time, which in itself could create crisis because you're not used to carrying something for weeks, and now you have it, and you can never be without it. And you set it down against a tree, you write something down, you take off, you leave it. You know, six kilometers back, you got to go get it again. So that, that that happened a lot. But yeah, you uh, when you enter into the long walk, it's they'll take you out of stress phase. They'll take you back to the barracks. They'll give you like an hour to you're like, oh, an hour to shower and gather all those maps and mark all the off limits areas and fold the maps, put them back in and be back outside for like an hour. You get a four minute shower. You feel better, change your clothes, and then they take you out to a wilderness area and set you down for a while. And uh, guys are snacking. They know something's coming. They know that something's, something's about to happen. And, and guys that know about selection or read about it knew. I didn't know. I mean, I didn't read anything about it. Again, I just went to it. And uh, so I know something's up. So I'm eating everybody's spare food. You know, any extra energy bars, I'll eat that. I'm eating it all. And I, I laid down and fell asleep and woke up sicker than a dog. I mean, I oh. gone. Going to the bathroom, it was horrible. And then I, I had finished, I was the second fastest. I, I learned later, I didn't know then. So I was blood too. So they go by speed throughout all of selection. So there was one guy faster than me in selection who had done all of selection already. To include the long walk, he just didn't get picked up. So he's back. Oh. To you know, he, I don't think he finished the long walk. Once you finish, you never have to do it again, but he didn't finish the long walk all the way. So he's doing it. So he's been through the entire thing already. So he's, he knows. And then I'm blood too. And they call me, it's about midnight when you start freezing cold. And the Sergeant Major's like, blah, 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 blah. You know, I came like this, don't do that. Any questions? I went, uh-uh. <laughs> I took off walking. I kept looking back. I'm like, I'm out of sight, right? Yeah, I can't see me. So I jump off, go to the bathroom, look at my flag. I'm like, where the hell am I? What am I doing? I, why didn't I not ask questions, you know? I don't even know where I'm at. And so I, I start the long walk. I end up going over the first mountain instead of around it because I... <laughs> the instead of following the chem lights um i was sick the whole way so i'd jump off the trail go to the bathroom jump back on i'd take off running because i was terrified i was gonna you know be behind and then i'd you know one time i jumped off the trail like flashlights going the wrong direction whoa i jump off hey you know i'm not supposed to do that where are you guys going oh we're going you know we just left the start and i go i just left the start and i came from that way so we didn't figure out that they had missed a turn and came back and i had gone the wrong way so we you know, and then four more people came and I'm like, oh, number one, I'm really behind now. You know, yeah. Get, and number two, am I lost? So I have this dilemma with six, six or so people going the wrong way. I convince them to go my way. Then they no, and they try and they convince me to go the other way. And finally I broke away. I go, you know, I'm sorry guys. I took off. I turned around, went the way I was going and found the trail that they had missed. You know, I beat it down with my weapon and pulled back the mountain laurel so everybody else could see the trail. And I took off running. And I, I ran so much of that 40 miler as much as I could. I was so terrified I was behind that because I was so sick and that I didn't eat until probably the last 10 miles walking up a mountain. I remember tucking down beef stew, like out of a packet and just walking. I was so sick, but it was demoralizing. It was, um, before the river, which is way over half, they, they sent me the wrong direction as well. Um, I forgot about that. The walk-in RV and later, you know, I walk up and they're sitting there pointing one way. All right, I take off running. You know, I take off going that way, and I'm, I'm making it fit the map. I'm, yeah, it fits the wow. map. Yeah. And I keep walking, keep walking. Now it's starting to turn. I'm like, this is not what, what the. And I figured it out at the end. I turn around and went back, probably three or four kilometers, ran all the way back, and the guy's standing there pointing the other direction. Yeah, like. And they knew the behind the scenes, they know. I mean, people make mistakes and you hide it so no one knows you made the mistakes. I've run I've run selection three or four or five times since then. So I know you make mistakes, you hide it. And as long as the candidate doesn't know, it's perfect. And they had sent another um, operator in with ropes on his back to make a rope bridge because one guy had gone that way years before and drowned trying to cross a creek, which they thought I would try to do, you know, to make up time. So they sent a guy in to make a rope bridge and I ended up beating him back and turned around and going the other way. So there I go, take off running again. I go, oh my God, oh my God. And then finally I'm walking up that hill, sucking on beef stew, lost my compass. Um, 
throwing my rucksack over the mountain laurel on top of this mountain. And I'm like, you know what? F this. Who, who wants this shit, man? I'm not good enough. I got lost. I, I'm, I'll never get picked now, you know? I lost my compass. I, I went back. I don't know how far I went back. I found it. I'm like, oh, my God, there's my compass. Popped out trail within 10 minutes later, just lunging forward, lunging forward like football on all fours. And boom, I'm out on the trail. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's like, which way? You know, I turned and ran, and there was a truck. There was a truck about a half a mile down that trail, and I was back on track. And that was the first cadre that motivated me. Hey, here's some water. Here's some water. Keep going. You're doing great. You're doing great. I'm like, I am. And I was going to get on his truck. Wow. Really take yeah. Me home. He probably didn't want to take me home. So um, he, you know, he gave me some water. I plotted the next one and took off. And it was just, um, it was a plant. Is it plantation trails on top of a mountain? The trails like walking through a creek. I'm like, how's a creek on top of a mountain? And uh, <laughs> And literally, I would start. I mean, I remember making mental jokes about, and it's like two map sheets long of a trail so far that we go to the next RV. So I'm on one sheet, and I'm like, time to change the water in my socks. You know, just keep going, splashing there, fresh water. And I'd look on my map, go next intersection. If there's a truck there, I'm getting on it. And I'd pass. There'd be no truck. Next intersection. If there's a truck, I'm getting on it. There's no like truck. to give up to 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 yeah. turn it in. Yeah, yeah, I'm like done. So. uh wasn't a truck. I don't know if I'd have gotten on it anyway, but I got to the last truck and I thought, here we are, we're done. Like, it's got to be, right? It's got to be. And uh, hey, your next door if he is, I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding. <sighs> and I almost, almost gave up then. I looked at my map and it was like 800 meters up the pipeline, a, a gas pipeline. And I thought, well, come on, man. I, I, what? That's weird, right? Well, I'll stick with it 800 more meters, then I'll quit. And as I'm walking up that pipeline, I am, I got nothing left. I mean, I've got uh, absolutely nothing left in my body. And my, I like call my give a shitter was broken. And <laughs> I mean, I'm looking at my feet, you know, 800 meters in anything. I'm on a pipeline. I can't get lost. I'm grass is soaking wet. I'm soaking wet. And I hear, I hear Sergeant Satterley. I'm like, oh shit, I'm in trouble. You know, <laughs> I, nobody's, nobody's using the name in a month. And I look up and they're like, for you, the stress phase has ended. I'm like, why? 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 You know, why? I'm and I kept walking. Like, no, oh, start to stop. For you, selection is over. I'm like, but why? And they jump <laughs> to grab my rucksack. I'm like, no, no, no. And I'm gonna keep going. Like, no, 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 you finished. And I'm like, wait, what? I finished? <laughs> I'm done. Like, I'm supposed to be done. <laughs> Congratulations. Like, oh shit, take that rucksack, man. Get it off me. <laughs> and, uh, I'm sure I wasn't as spry as I'm talking now, but you know, they carry you over to a fire, give you some sandwiches and some glue vine and and uh wait for other people to come in. But nobody came in for a bit, so they stuck me in a 15 passenger van. You know, normally they fly you back because it's good distance, I'm tired, but the, the weather was so bad that they had to drive us back. So I climbed underneath the seats of this 15 passenger van and passed out. Jesus. Woke up and uh took a shower and I was like man I don't even know how I did that I don't even know what I don't even know how long it took me and uh and there was nobody in the barracks but one guy wow sleep already I'm like, man <laughs> wow well um okay great let's let's transition then from that horrible experience to your first combat experience which um if if the book is if I'm remembering it correctly, is the Battle of Mogadishu, right? You're you're in Delta. It's 1993. You're in uh, Somalia, and I guess there's so much to talk about here, and I don't want to make you relive all this, but I would just ask, like, if you take yourself from that from that soldier who had missed Panama and Gulf War, and you're finally riding in, what were you feeling going into that mission? Three October or the very first ones. Why don't you, maybe the first one, the first time where you're like, I'm in combat now. Cause I think for a lot of people, they can relate to that feeling. They've been waiting so long to do it. And it's got this Hollywood glamor to it. What were you feeling at that time? Yeah. I was believing all the Hollywood glamor. Um, you know, the, uh, I said, old Vietnam movie where they coming in apocalypse now. Da, 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 da. We're flying in all our helicopters, man. I'm thinking we need some music blared. You know what I mean? I'm having fun. 
I'm in the middle. I'm hanging out. I'm the first guy down the rope. I throw the rope or somebody throws the rope. I'm the first guy down the rope. I'm, I'm sitting in the middle. I got my gun hanging out. I'm leaning out this black hog with just a little seat belt holding me in, you know, and I'm, I don't have a care in the world. If that belt broke, I wouldn't care. I'd probably shoot people on the way down. I, I ain't care. Um, flying over this city, this dirty city, just waiting. And, and the fear's there, kind of, but I don't know what to be afraid of yet. I mean, I know, right? But I, it's never happened. So like a child, like children who think, oh, that looks easy on TV or that, you know, there's no experience with it. So they don't know how to uh, judge it. Same, same with me, you know, I'm 23 maybe. And uh, I, I don't know anything in the world, man. I'm hanging out of a helicopter with a, with a, 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 a 1100 shotgun. I, I'm covered with slugs, beanbag rounds and buckshot all around my body. I don't know why I carried that thing. I was the breacher. So I thought, I'll breach. I, I mean, there's enough guns, right? I don't need another gun. So I'll be a breacher. And I can use the 1100 shotgun if I had to for anything. And, uh, so I carried that for the first five missions and uh, I used it, but only with beanbag rounds. And I, I you know, I, Osman auto capture was another one that got a little, little sketchy where we did like the first vehicle interdiction, stopped the moving car, chased him into a house. Um, but you know what? So those four first four missions, that's what I think a lot of people think combat is. You win the day, you tell stories, you're high five. Did you see that guy? Did you see the way that thing that, you know, you may or may not shoot at anybody. I didn't shoot anyone. I didn't shoot at anybody until the fifth mission. But people are shooting at you and you hear the crack of the rounds. And I mean, ooh, man, that's scary enough. And, uh, and then the Osman Honor Capture, they had to call us in and bring us in because the firefight started erupting near the hospital, the dig for hospital. And as soon as we hit the ground, we were under fire and me and my buddy took off running. And I'm one down, he's two down on the road. We take off running down this alleyway. It was eight foot walls on both sides and then gates that go in and we're running down and we're taking fire. And I'm like, uh, I guess we screwed up that close far ambush thing, you know, close <laughs> salt through it. Here's a far ambush. We're salting through it. And I'm halfway down this, this alleyway thinking, oh shit, we popped into a, an, an entryway for a gate. So we can get behind cover. And I look back and then, Everybody else on the team's behind a pile of rocks where we where we roped in. <laughs> so if we're out there by ourselves shooting at the guy at a machine gun position and would would take him out from a distance. You didn't really see it happen. You just, just stop shooting. And then that somebody'd walk across the street and then the machine gun start shooting again. So we'd take him out. Somebody walk across the street, get down behind the machine gun. They weren't armed, so they knew our rules. Um so the next person that sprinted across the street towards the machine gun, I, I shot him. And my buddy's like, what are you doing? I'm like, it's, they're feeding the weapon, man. I can't, one of these are going to hit us. So we just kept them away from the weapon. And then a lady comes walking down the street. We weren't taking fire for a bit. And here comes a lady walking down the street like she's going to the market. I mean, I hadn't been any fire for five or 10 minutes. And she's standing and she stops. And then 30, 40 yards away at the most, looking around, looking around, sees us and then points. And we start taking fire. And so we, 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 we stop that. And then I, I shoot her, you know, I tell her, go away, tell her, go away and blah, blah, blah. And it doesn't happen. So I shoot her with the bean bag rounds over and over again. So she finally just leaves. I'm like, you know, the next time I'm just going to put a, put one in her gut and just drop her. Mm -hmm. and, you know, people judge you for that, but am I supposed to wait for her to keep pointing out right. my position and then me take her around in the head or my buddy take her around the head and then take her out. That's not how it works. Um, and anybody that would be there would do the same damn thing. You know, so that's that's Osman Auto Capture. I'm 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 on the roof on Xville. Uh, actually, I'm on the second floor. The last teams are Xfilling minus ours, and somebody jumps out from a window across the street with an AK, pointing up in the air, and I can see him like and I'm staring at him with my weapon, like whoa, you know, like too fast to do anything. And I remember getting my heart rate just racing, 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 and and I hadn't hunted before either, so you know, you know, buck fever, whatever it is. I'd never had it. I'm like, whoa, whoa, my heart's just, I can see my aim point just going up and down, up and down, breathing. I'm, like, I'm about to shoot this guy. And he's trying to shoot the helicopter that's hovering above the house I'm in. And I just, whew, training, brought it all together. Um, I think I hit him right in the head. His weapon went flying out the window and he disappeared. I never saw him again. I was trying to like, did you see that? Scream, did you see that shit? Yeah. Hey, my team there comes running over. He goes, what, 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 what's going on? I go, I just shot that. He goes, good job. Get back to work. Yeah, and he left. 
And then I'm on the roof trying to climb up, off the roof. I'm the last guy out of this whole building and, and I'm trying to climb up this helicopter just hovering over the, the building, taking fire, you know. It's like flying 24 hours in a 30 second period for those pilots. <laughs> Climbing up the wheel, getting pulled in. You know, and we that to me was harrowing. I got to pull my trigger, I got shot yeah. at a I'm on a helicopter, I'm like, that's combat, I'm, I'm good. You know, <laughs> seen enough. And then three October rolled around and I had switched to an M4 after that. And I carried a short shotgun and I switched to an M4. And we rolled in on three October, um, flared, threw the ropes out, fast roped into a dust bowl. I don't even know. We were outside the perimeter of the Rangers who had already been set in. So there's a danger of running in and getting shot by your own kind. Um, we're already taking fire. Uh, Blackburn already fell out of another helicopter. We landed, had to take take another house down full of a family that was just horrible. And then, you know, left them, fought our way down the street, got to the target building, took all the detainees, searched the building, rolled up, ready to go. And a five ton get hits with an RPG um, and caught fire. I, I didn't get the reports of who's injured and wounded and stuff, but I know it's kind of happening. And then we're waiting to exfil in the courtyard and I hear an RPG go off overhead. I, I happened to look up and caught the tail of the, the, the Blackhawk spinning off to the east and north a little bit. And I, young, not in charge of anybody. My only job is to break stuff and shoot people. And I, I knew. I knew something was different now. I, I knew we were going to have to go there. So they hatched a plan. We started moving down the street. And it was the weirdest thing I'd ever seen. Um, I'm starting to get scared. But still, we're winning the day. And I'd look up a block or two up. And there'd be hundreds of people paralleling us, trying to get to the helicopter before us. And I knew we had to go fast and give up security and use speed. And we were starting to take more fire. And when we turned and went north, um, I was out in the middle of the street shooting at someone up by the crash site. And I looked over, I saw a buddy of mine who was shooting up the street. I looked back and started shooting. A friend of mine shot a uh, 203 rifle grenade up there. And then when I looked back, there was two guys dragging an operator away. And it was Earl. And I didn't know what happened. I think he was wounded or, you know, I didn't know he was dead. And that's where they stayed the whole night. We ended up pushing another block and a half up to the crash site, taking it down, getting settled in the house. Um, I didn't even know we were at the crash site for probably a couple hours until someone blew a hole in the building. And I saw it sitting right there. I'm like, holy shit, we're here. Um, but, man, they were picking our house away, apart with RPGs, the rocket propel grenades all night. Um, Hit, hit my friend leaning up against the wall and I was standing there and was hitting the face with all the shrapnel um, and, and debris, the, the rocks. And I remember one of my friends who, who's dead now, just died a month ago, asked me, um, what was that? Like, looked at me like, what was that? I go, I don't know, man. I'm like, it's all calm. And then I screamed, RP. I was running into the room. I was in shock. It's on fire. There's a whole side of the house is missing. There's the helicopter now. And I thought, there were chunks of his body laying on the ground. I went to pick up his leg because he's this tall guy. And it was a big concrete chunk. And when I pulled up, he came crawling, oh, gasping for air. And he didn't know what was going on. So drug him out. He was fine, minus getting, you know, the wind knocked out of him. He was knocked out for a minute. Now I got this couch on fire in the room. I'm, I'm breathing smoke and pouring water, the water we had in a flower pots and throwing up from the smoke. And I thought, man, this is, this is getting bleak, you know. We're the farthest north and the farthest west team on the front lines and the whole east side of our building's gone now and they're just coming from the west and i started laying mattresses up against the walls like this will stop some of it you know and pulling guard the whole night and then you could hear the the gunfire all night um and i, I remember oh. asking, i'm asking team leader one time are they going to make it and his answer was i don't know you know what was it at what point did that become like, this is real for me now? Like, was it the, the RPG hitting the tail rotor? Because um, it sounds like you had those first five missions. Things are escalating gradually. And then you're in this tenacious firefight. When I saw Earl being drug away, I thought, man, I wish I had a, a, a real helmet. And I wish I had more Kevlar. Uh, I started wishing a lot. Yeah, I, I really, if you're wishing in combat, it's too late. You're screwed. So I felt screwed. So that's when I started realizing, hmm, the next was when um, 
when the Rangers got hit outside our building, when that RPG hit, and I had to go out and pull, pull in, pulled in one of them and then sent back out later to bring in the, the M60 that was blown apart outside, and I, you know, and, and then packing this guy's wounds. I'm trying to tell him, hey, you know, your scrotums, you know, somebody walks up and goes, is that his nuts? And I'm like, hey, hey, uh, he's a Hispanic kid, you know, he's real worried about having kids, and I've been telling him all the time, you're good, you're good, you're good. I'm like, you're supposed to talk to oh. So I'm, I'm literally doing what I was taught. Hey, where'd you go to college, man? Where'd you go to high school or whatever, you know? And trying to keep him from that, and then my buddy walks up and goes, oh, those is nuts. I'm like, oh, it's not working. Oh. The other guy had his heel blown off. I'm trying to f- put that on there, so I'm realizing... You know, people are getting injured. And then, you know, the one ranger across the street bleeds out. Dude, it's from moral artery. They couldn't clip it off. And then um, you hear about other people. People start whispering about other guys that got hurt, might be dead. And you're like, what? Friends, you know? And then when um, one guy was creeping up between our two buildings, and I, I literally had to pull out. I tried to shoot him, couldn't get my rifle out. Then when I pulled my 45 out, stuck it through the bars and pulled the trigger, but the hammer fell on sand. It didn't go off. I'm like, wow, oh my gosh. So I had to pull out a little Austrian grenade and pull, pull the pin and showed it to the guy standing at the door across the room for me, you know, like looking out the other window and showed him. He's shaking his head. No, no. I'm like, oh yeah. You know, <laughs> I dropped it out the window and I watched it hit the top of his head and rolled down his neck. And I just laid on the bed and I rolled up and laid on the bed and it went off and stuff just hit the ceiling inside. And people came running in the room like, what was that? What was that? And I literally lied. I lied like I was in trouble. Like I was a flashbang. I just throw them flashbangs. And, you know, I don't know why to this day. I, I figured I was in trouble probably. And uh, and the guy in the door was like, he's lying. That was a grenade. And I jumped up. That's right. That was a damn grenade. Look out the window. You know, he didn't have to look out the window to see what was on the ceiling and smell it. But, and I remember running out of ammo. And I had my knife out at one point for some, some reason. You know, like that'll help me. And I remember thinking, this is it. I mean, that's my switch flipped for the rest of my life that 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 night, that moment. I know it was that moment. Because I thought I'm dead. Yeah. I'm dead. And it took me a couple of minutes probably to make peace with it that that this is it. That's it. Everything I've done is is over. Whatever I did, I got, and that's it. And I'll be dead. So I'm gonna take as many as I can with me. And, and help as many of my friends as I can possibly get out of here. And, uh, you know, then we got resupplied, which opened up another firefight. And then the next morning, when the 10th Mountain got there with a couple of uh, Malaysian armored personnel carriers and pulled the, the helicopter frame off the pilots, which is why we were there. We weren't going to leave their bodies. Um, threw all the dead on top. I opened up the back of one of the APCs, and it was just so full. There was, you know, usually in the military... How many people can you get into a five ton? One more is the answer. It's always one more. <laughs> it's not one more. They, literally, the door was pulled back shut. It was still full of Rangers, man. They, um, there was I wasn't getting in there. So they had this plan. Listen, there's going to be some of you that have to walk out, but we'll go slow with the vehicles. They'll be cover. And as soon as the first shots ring out, those vehicles took off. Boom, and they were gone. So we were left running with no cover, no ammo, you know, the Mogadishu mile until we got back to all the other vehicles and loaded up. And when, you know, I thought the story's over. Oh, we're, we're here. There's tanks shooting down the street. There's machine guns going off on all these vehicles. There's people everywhere. I looked up at a Malaysian driver who was down, down inside of his armored vehicle. You know, he wouldn't come out. And I'm like looking at him standing on the street, like smacking him on the head. Thank you. Thank you. And he, he didn't care. He didn't care. Um, I'd been there all night. I was ready. I was ready to yeah. something. And so we hopped in two Humvees and they took off in the wrong direction and got lost with the rest. We went to the pack stadium. The two Humvees that I got into went all the way back to the airfield through more firefights and all along the way, finally made it back. And I was still, I was angry, but I was alive and I didn't know the casualty levels. And I waited at the back gate for about 30 minutes maybe we didn't have a radios with batteries and I'm waiting for the rest of the convoy and so we drove around the entire airfield along the beach and around the airfield and as we pulled up towards our hangar I saw about 12 bodies laying on the street covered in poncho liners and I could see boots and there were a lot of jungle boots ranger boots but there were a lot of adidas assault boots which were ours and I I couldn't look I I, one guy had an rpg sticking out of his ribs and it was not detonated sandbagged in I'm like holy shit um, turned to go into our, our compound and there were Humvees just parked left, right here and there. 
blood spilling out of the back of sand everywhere with bleach smell. The sun was coming up more and more and getting warmer. I was like, I could smell it. And I'll never forget that smell of sand and bleach and blood together. And all I could do, we walked in the hangar and I, and I started loading up my weapon and cleaning stuff and, and getting ammo and water. My buddy turns to take a picture and I was angry, really angry. He goes, you'll thank me for this later. And it's, it's the picture I have, I think, in my book and, and people love. Just me standing there looking really pissed off. Now, there's only a couple of us back in our hangar and the rest, I don't know where they're at. They're all at the Pakistani stadium or dead. I, I don't know. And then finally flights started coming in bringing in guys in Pakistani stadium, coming back and finding out that we're missing Gary and Randy. We're missing some crew chiefs. People are dead. And I'm like, Oh man. And from that, you know, from those moments on, you know, even though I, I went around the world and did a lot, a lot more in Iraq again, um, I go into a room and say, who wants to get in a firefight with me? Anybody raises their hands. I pick all the other people. because <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go with anybody. No, anybody that wants to be in a firefight's never been in one. So I'll take the ones that don't put their hand up because they have the experience. Um, anybody yeah. that wants to do it hasn't done it yet or been in a real, real good one. So they don't know that, you know, bullets fly both ways. <laughs> Tracer rounds work for everybody and so do lasers and all that technology. When you see a, a young kid shoot a friend of yours, maybe don't even know what he's doing and he shoots a highly trained individual, you're like, wow. A lot of luck involved here too. Mm -hmm. So the reality sets home that training, sure, training's good. Get you so far, right? And then there's a lot of, uh, you know, wrong place, wrong time. So I wanted to ask, I know you and, and Jen do a lot for PTS in, in your post-military career. And something that you brought up where you said, like you came to to terms with the fact that you might not make it out, right? Like that you had this moment. I'm, I'm curious, and I know you're not a doctor, but do you do you feel like it's a a moment in time where that flip switches, where, where the switch flips, or is it a progressive movement of increasingly dangerous acts, and then you finally just hit a tipping point? It's both, and we've 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 shown it with science, and it's bi it's biological completely. You have complex PTS and then you have PTS. And I didn't know the difference. It's PTSD. We throw out the D because nobody likes that word disorder. It makes you feel sick. So we just throw it out. Like Canadians, I think, use uh, occupational stress injury. It's the same thing. It's just depression. It's ups it's uh so you have PTS, which you could witness a car wreck, right? You get PTS for a bit. You know, you, next time you're out there, you get you get rear-ended at a stoplight, right? You go up that next stoplight and your brain's waiting for that same story. Your brain's always waiting to finish a story and it always remembers the past. So it's, it's thinking last time I was here, I got rear ended. So your, your mind, you're like, Whoa, I'm going to get hit. So that's called PTS. And that goes away. That'll go away quickly, you know? Um, but when you have PTS event after PTS event after PTS event after PTS event, biologically your hippocampus and your, your, your parasympathetic nervous system stops operating correctly. It's like, this is always happening. It's always happening. So it's always ready for that that end of that story it's trying to create the end of the story but it's living in the middle to where all these bad things that have happened to me all these bad things that happened to your mind's expecting it over and over, over again so if you don't deal with it you're going to always live that way and then guys create their ending right they go ahead and create their ending they either they kill themselves because they just think it's going to happen or they drink themselves to death to the point or they drink themselves and get into a family altercation and then they feel that shame that they feel they can't recover from but it's all biological and we've proven that it can be taken away. So it can happen one time and that could last for a long time from somebody or it could happen one time and last forever. Depends on the work you put into it. But most of it is multiple time after time, after time, after time of combat, after combat, after combat, you know, guys going on one to 10 missions a night for a 90 day period. You know, that's, yeah. a, that's, a, that's a lot of volume. And, uh, and it's like, you get back and your brain's just, this is what it's going to be like. It's so it never shuts off. So your, your fight or flight is always on and you're always ready to do fight. So you bring it home to your families. You know, you bring it home to the kids who left a dish in the sink and you handle it like you handle everything else. It's a problem. I'm going to get on top of it violently and fast and fix it. Right. And the kids are like, what? <laughs> your wife's like, what? You don't need to act that way. And like act, act what way? What am I doing? Well, you're yelling. No, I'm not. Well, you don't need to be violent about it. I'm not violent. Just do the fucking dishes. You know, it's 
it's those things that become, we call it muscle memory now. And we tell everybody, look, we're not doing therapy with you. Mm -hmm. we're, 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 we're altering your muscle memory. We're retraining to change your muscle memory. 10,000 times of combat, 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 everything's combat to you. So let's do this practice to where 10,000 times of saying nice things, right? And you know, that's the simplest forms. Um, but it works. Guys like, how do I get past this? How do I get past being angry all the time? I said, yeah, I had to break it. I had to break the cycle once I learned some tools and get to, I would tell jokes when we started fights. I would start telling jokes right in the middle of a fight. And of course, you should tell your spouse about it because it might upset them that you're making a joke in the middle of an argument unless they know what you're doing. I was trying to break the cycle of fighting and then trying to win the fight. And then when I'm trying to win, she's trying to win and then the relationship loses. So I'm like, you know, I'm just going to crack jokes. There's nothing we're arguing about that's life altering or changing. I've done all that already. So it's all about the muscle memory and retraining. But yeah, it, it's everybody we talk to in mine. Uh, there's guys that either done it once or twice. There's guys that have done it thousands of times. And then there's people that get to work right away. And then there's people that get to work 10 years from now. And I, you know, I've talked to guys, a uh, guy that fought in the Battle of the Bulge after a speak engagement last year. And we were crying at the table. He's like, I, I never went and got help. And his family's around the table, his grandkids are around the table, like, we never knew, Grandpa, all these little kids, we love you. And he's like, oh, I'm going to get help tomorrow. We're all crying. I'm like, you waited all this time to get help. And then Vietnam vet guy comes over and starts crying. I went waiting since Vietnam. I go, as long as you wait, that's how long it starts to get to feel better, right? Yeah. We, we control our own destinies. But, and both of those guys, um, different, different incidences, one event, multiple events, the same outcome. Mm -hmm. So, You've got people who have had those events. If uh, I wonder if if you look at the there's a 20 year old out there right now, right, who's getting ready to ship out and hasn't hit that yet, but also has the allure of Hollywood and this is what it's going to be like and I got to get into combat. Do you is there anything you could say to somebody like that to help them prepare for what's coming? It, how to how to approach it? realistically or pragmatically but also to get their mind in a place to handle what is about to come yeah we absolutely give them the tools and, and I, we do it we call it resiliency training and we go we spoke to 600 young recruits sf recruits at fort bragg in february before covid broke out and we're going back in december finally um going there now four times a year to talk to them through their process straight off the street going into selection going into the training and language and then before you deploy. So they're going to hear it four times and they've never been to combat before. And I tell them, I stand up there talking to a guy I know, you kids out there, you got it all figured out. You're so smart. You're so mo you're so motivated and energetic. And you're full of testosterone. Who's this old guy talking shit up here? I get it. I'd be thinking the same thing. And I probably did think the same thing. You know everything and I don't. But I'm going to tell you, if I'm going to tell it to you enough, you're going to hear it enough that when the incident happens, in the back of your mind, you'd be like, oh, I remember Tom saying something about this would happen one day. At least you'll have the tools to start working on it. At least we're telling you over and over and over again, and, and commands doing a lot better is get help. You're not going to be kicked out. You're not going to be this or that. Now I tell them it's just like working out. It's like taking your weapon to the range and zeroing it. It's like practicing CQB. You're not good at anything until you do it over and over again, right? You go to the gym, you want bigger muscles. You run more if you want more cardio. You know, you do cardio workouts and, and, and like I said, you go to the range and you practice and you're really good at shooting, but what do you do for your head? Nothing, right? If you want to be a war fighter, then sharpen every tool you have. And your brain is the most powerful tool, right? And if, you, if, it's, if it's bogged down, if you have a guy bogged down with family problems, he's on his 10th year of deployments, 20th year of deployments, and, he's, and he's, you don't know what's going on at home. I'm sure he's bogged down. We got COVID going on. A lot of guys are bogged down with that too. And People losing jobs, it's the stress is always there. If you're at work, you can't tell me that you're 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 fully fit and ready to go warrior unless you're, you know, you can be a better warrior by managing and handling all that. So we tell them, we, we almost make it part of their indoctrination now, which I think they're doing. Because once you tell somebody it's okay, and a group of guys do it, and it's more than just the leadership, because the young kids are like those old guys, they don't know what they're doing. Hell, hell my, my stepkids and my own son doesn't think I know shit, right? They don't, hey, you don't know anything. Coach taught me that he really listens you got to bring an outside source of someone they respect over and over again and then the grassroots effort of the young guys coming up 
hearing it and wanting to work on it before it's a problem. It's like relationship problems. A lot of guys have all relationship problems as well. And when they finally call me to see our therapist or talk to our therapist, it's because their wife's going to leave them. I said, there you went and went and did it like, like everyone else. I'm not going to go to a therapist until I absolutely have to, until my wife's got a foot out the door. Then I'll promise it. I'll promise. It. Okay, baby. Why would you wait till it's totally trash to go work on something? Why would you go wait till you tore your bicep to go work on your bicep? Right. It's uh, I try to equate it to them in ways that they already have been taught from childhood up and believe when you're trying to teach somebody something new, it's going to take a long time before they even hold on to it. If ever, because everything we know in life, we've been taught from childhood. So that is our belief system. So we try to get in there and tackle it in a way that they can understand it and relate to it. So they pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. And we almost, we, we kind of gloss over as you describe multiple hits a night for 90 days at a time, which was your experience. It sounds like in Iraq in the post nine 11 era. Right. And, and what that does to you, especially because at that point you're in a leadership role as opposed to what you described in Moog, where you're you don't have responsibility for anyone else, really. And now you have these other people on the line. How did that weigh on you when you're in Iraq and in that leadership role? God, it's the worst. It's the worst thing ever. Um, you know, I spent my life worrying that I wasn't good enough, mainly because I wanted to be good enough to help other people. Right. As a leader. I'm not a good enough leader, right? But continue on with that feeling. Never a good enough leader. Even though guys have told me, you're the best leader I've ever had. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You tell that to everybody, right? So I, I just never believe it. So my great fear was being a leader and being in charge and responsible for other people's souls, you know, their other, other people's lives and telling them to go out versus, now I know they want to be there, right? And they volunteered to be there. Now they deployed over, but I'm the guy saying, let's go hit this. You know, and I gave them all buy-in, you know, all my team leaders, hey, if we're going to do a hit, I want your buy-in on it, unless I, can, you know, obviously we have these things, I am a leader, yeah. to do it, but you're, playing, you're going in the door, blah, 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 it's your mission, you brief it back to me in the command and we'll approve it or not, you know, and there's times the the leadership, is, oh, we're not doing that one, I'm like, oh, I want to do this, I'm like, oh, look at him, I'm like, no, we're not, you're not even going in the building, so don't even try to talk about it, you know, if I let you go in, you'll go in, but you're not going to tell them how to blow open the doors and what doors and windows they go in. That's them. That's them. They're, they have more experience put together than, than, than certainly the officer, not as much me, but more of them together right. and fresh and young. And, you know, so I give it to them, but being in charge of them, man, I, I really, I, I, I'd say a prayer, you know, whether I'm religious or spiritual or not is, is neither here nor there. Everybody's spiritual or religious in combat. <laughs> Going out that door, going out that gate, I'd put my head down, be like, please let me make good decisions. Please let me bring these men home. You know, in the time of crisis is when I need help. You know, those things that overwhelm you. And that's when I, that's, that's when I become my best. I'm horrible when there's nothing to do. I'm horrible when it's easy. But when there's 35 things coming at me and they all want to kill me, I thrive there. And I thrived in moving people around the battlefield and keeping track of where everybody was and, and kind of monitoring that. But it was so terrifying that when you'd hear, hey, shots fired or, or when you hear somebody on the radio going to make a call and then you hear this explosion, you can hear on the radio and then you can hear, feel the house rumble and then you hear this medic and you're like, oh, shit, who is it? You know, and that that kills me. I'd rather get shot or be killed or be dead or anything than have any one person under under my command get a scratch on them. and it was unrealistic but you know i had one get pretty messed up um he's okay that That's i can me. remember the rest were pretty you know knock on wood was i was pretty clean with it um yeah so tom how and we kind of touched on this at the beginning but you, you brought up again like you're not good enough even though you're at the you know, the major league equivalent of the job and you got people telling you that you're doing great. Have you gotten to a point now where you can look at that more like logically because it, it clearly you're doing a great job, but I feel like there are a lot of people who have that mentality. So are you in a place now where you think maybe I am good enough or is it a constant struggle for you? 
no, I'm not there. I, I judge myself every day. Um, and then when I make mistakes, it's even worse. I, uh, yeah. Yes. Right. Enough is, you know, am I a good enough husband? Am I a good enough father? Never, 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 never. Um, but am I doing enough? No. So I'm never pleased with my performance. Uh, I like when I finish jobs, you know, I like when I complete things like I'm the guy that wants to, I'd be happy if you put me in a big tractor and I could mow the interstate right down the middle, driving it <laughs> go back in the other direction. I can see the grass I cut, right? <laughs> I, can, what I did stress-free. I can't cut grass any better. I'd probably figure out how can I cut this quicker? You know, like when I'm in the yard, I start <laughs> patterns and shit. I'm like, I'm bored. I'm going to mow in patterns. So it's, I think it's the, I think it's the personality maybe that got me where I am. It's also the personality yeah. that can destroy you unless you're careful with it. Cause people I talked to at work were always the same. Oh, I thought you were the badass. You know, you're the badass. Nobody wants to, well, there are some that do, but so, most people don't want to yeah. take credit for being good or, or think that they're the man. And, and it's, we used it as a tool to do better. Yeah. And I better at not letting it weigh on me. I still feel that way, but I do a lot better about not letting it weigh me down. Mm -hmm. um, inside, you know, I talk about it a lot more versus when I'm in the unit, you know, you just, you just put on a show. You got a mask on every day. I'm, I, you know, swipe your card, it turns green. You're like, Ooh, I'm a commando for another day. Mm -hmm. And then you go in and you just do your thing and act like nothing bothers you. But inside you're worried that you're not going to be, good enough you're not going to be there the next day you know and it, it unfolded for me as a team leader when they did a sergeant major day where you, you know sergeant major comes up with all this crazy shit to hurt everybody and you go out and you do this long 20 mile event with obstacle courses and swimming and whatever just to destroy you you know and it's a team competition and so i'm working with my old team and uh carrying the sledgehammer my rug i'm carrying all the weight i'm the guy i'm the guy and these young kids are coming up chasing your heels and i start slowing down i could not physically do it and uh you know in my mind's like that's all the paperwork crap i gotta do this and that you know i'm getting <laughs> and they're trying to take this sledgehammer and some weights out of my ruck so we can go faster and, and win I'm like you get off me you're not getting that shit from me you know and finally probably a quarter mile from the thing i let him take the sledge out of my back and i just kept going and we got to the end and we started to catch up with the team that was in second place now and i took off running i took off sprinting we passed that team and got second but i remember that day uh, wow. it still hurts that i remember the day that i let my teammate take some weight out of my ruck so wow. we could do it i fucking wow. hate it more than anything um yeah, yeah. I'm still that I somebody had to rely. I, I could, I was, I was, I was the anchor, right? Mm -hmm. And not of stability. I was the anchor holding them back. <laughs> they got the sails up, you know. I, I do yeah. a lot of about you're either an anchor or a sail, and you need both. But when do you use them, you know? Right. And uh, yeah, I felt like that anchor, and I'll, I'll probably never forget that day. Oh man! And I don't want to take up a ton more time. There's another fallacy though that I want to at least touch on, and you from reading the book. Seems like you have had at least five near-death experiences, but I assume it's more, and that's just what you see in the book. Whether it's you're in Moog, the room blows up as you walk out, you know, somebody pulls you to the side, they get a hit, you get some shrapnel, um, you know, your hits in Iraq, you're in the car with the gun, like all those experiences. And I think the Hollywood portrayal of that is you come out on the other side of that and you're like, oh, life is so great. I almost lost it. But what does it really feel like in those situations? I think you realize that luck, luck played a part. Um, training gets you there. And training will take you through some things, uh, but a lot of luck, you know, not getting shot um, at, in, uh, in Columbia. People have accidental discharges all the time, especially untrained Columbia military people. Yep. Um, so they have a barrel in my mouth. Uh, doesn't bother me. I was terrified then. And my I, I got drunk that night, but <laughs> it was, uh, you know, all the things that go wrong, luck, luck. They didn't smack me with it. Luck. We didn't all get killed. Um, luck that I wasn't in the room and, and, and luck that, you know, you got holes in your clothes. 
of, of AK rounds. And, and you're like, whoa, I didn't feel that. And then I, you become aware that one inch on this planet could be the difference between life and death um, or walking again or not. I've got friends that, that, that were in that inch that are dead or missing limbs or messed up. And it really, it takes away the glamour of combat for me. I, 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 I watched Black Hawk Down when it came out. I haven't been able to watch it since. I walked out, Saving Private Ryan opening scene. It was too much, too real, yeah. which is good. But I think a movie can take you so far and Saving Private Ryan took it pretty far. Um, but you just, if you know you're not going to die, it's easy, isn't it? Um, it's real easy to say you'll do it. It's real easy if you think you're not going to die. But when you know that you can die and you've had friends that die, it completely changes it. And it's not romantic. It's, it's war is disgusting. Um, is it necessary? Sadly, I think it is necessary because talking doesn't always get it. Um, mm -hmm. But it's disgusting. And it, and it, it takes away more than people even think about think of all the pain at home i mean those are casualties of war those behind the behind the wall you don't see of these families i hear about all the time you know and then you got abuse of all kinds right physical verbal alcohol drugs abuse i mean and then add covid right add covid yeah. on people can't go anywhere it's gotten so bad it's gotten so much worse i think even president trump said it on tv the other day suicides are up, abuse is up, drugs are up. I'm like, yeah, it is. It is. It's depression. People have been thrown into PTSD symptoms, isolation, fear, unseen enemy. They don't know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And so we've been dealing with a lot of depression. It's going to get worse. Um, but the, but the point is, like we say, the greatest fear is a fair to try and never, never, ever quit because there's a way out. You know, if you quit and you stop trying, then no, there's not a way out. You're going to be, you're, you're there, right? You're there wherever you're at forever. And with all secure with the foundation, what's the, what's the focus going forward now? It sounds like obviously you're, you're working with Bragg. Um, where, where is that going next? You know, during COVID we were, this year we were going to start online content towards the end of the year, but when COVID hit and we couldn't see face to face, we canceled eight retreats this year we decided that we'd do our online content then. So we shifted and we, we, we videoed courses. We're getting ready to release courses. We've gone to online and phone therapy. We've done 80 sessions in the last month and a half with our therapist, probably have to get another therapist, um, but we don't just hire therapists. We hire and vet our therapists because they're, they're amazing when they get to work, but we're pushing forward. We're starting to release. We're going to release a new video. We're going to put those courses out within the next month for online. And it'll be free for veterans and active duty and civilians. It's, I mean, it's literally the same help for civilians. It's stress. Yeah. It's yes. I don't care how you get it. You know, we always talk about if you're a CEO or, or, or you work in the mail room or you're a general or a private, when you go home, you're somebody's spouse and they don't care what you do for a living. They want you to shut up and help out and be a, be a part of that family. And, uh, guys can't do that. Salesmen that are gone all the time. Don't do it. You know, CEOs, anytime you give up, your family, anytime you do so well at a business or an organization or whatever you're doing, if you're doing so well at it that you're at the top, something has, has, been, has been left behind. Something's, something had to give along the way, and that's typically the family. So everybody's asking for family help. So we're moving in more family help and help more people. But hopefully we're adding 10, 10 more retreats next year for veterans and also doing the resiliency training for post to post to post. And we've also picked up Zooms, um, doing brigade Zooms. That's great. For uh, special operations organizations to talk about this stuff when we can't actually see each other face to face. Yeah. So just last question here, Tom, you in particular, more than most, I mean, you went through truly hell, a couple different continents in the combat. You left the unit in, in what is described as Kind of not the probably the ideal way you would have liked to um you've had you know like you hit as you describe it rock bottom afterwards but it, as you look back at that journey um would you do it again knowing all the things that you went through yeah yeah <laughs> I'd, I'd do it again i hope i would do some of it differently but to get where i am now and and 
what I've learned and I've known my whole life, but what I really truly believe in though now, because I've, I've lived in it. Um, you know, when you're at rock bottom and you pull out a jackhammer and you go deeper, you're living it. And I, through adversity, through my worst mistakes, I've learned the most and I've been able to help people um, not make those same mistakes by making those mistakes versus helping them after they make the mistakes. So breaking mm-hmm. the cycle, and I wouldn't be able to do that without lived it. And I wouldn't be with my wife had I not taken all the steps along the way that I, that I did. So, you know, not taking away from any other spouse I've had in my life and, you know, apologizing for who I was back then, I wouldn't change a thing because I, I love where I've ended up and I love what we're doing now. Yeah. And well, thanks so much for the time, Tom. Uh, great stories, great foundation. The book is is excellent. So we'll put all the the links to how to find you and the book online with the with the episode. Thanks for the time. Oh, absolutely. And my wife's got a book coming out in February called Arsenal of Hope that'll that'll help the spouses with like, here's the other side. You, you saw my side in a, in a tad of the spouse side. Here's the spouse side. You know, here's here's another side of that hell we lived. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and your book goes into what what Jen is doing, right? I mean, in it not doing now, what she did for you, the training she took, and how she's helped kind of grow into this into the foundation you have today. Yeah, she's the hero in my book. Um, when you read it, and you take she's the hero. She's the one that started listening to people. You know, we're, we listen to each other. We're like, whatever, dude. She listens mm-hmm. and hurts something, and then she responds thoughtfully and in kind, and start helping people and you know, let's do a foundation. Uh, how do you do that? She goes, we'll figure it out. So we kept going and kept going, kept going and figured it out. We got it going. And uh, yeah, I mean, she runs it. We're both, we're co-CEOs, but man, I, you know, I'm the pretty face. No, she's the pretty face. So, yeah, I do what she tells me. We help people yeah. and I share my experiences and she brings it all together. So um, yeah, she's an amazing person. And, and along with that, she's helped a lot of people as well. Yeah, it's clear. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Appreciate the time. Yeah, thank you. I hope you enjoyed this combat story. If you want to tell your own story, go to combatstory.com. If you know someone we should interview, send me their info at ryan at combatstory.com. Hearing these stories can be tough or bring back your own memories. If you're battling PTSD, please call the Veteran Crisis Line at one 800 273 8255 273 8255 Stay safe